Hello, and welcome to the third episode of the Raspberry Pi Pod podcast. My name is Michael Horn, and I'm a Raspberry Pi enthusiast and blogger. As before, if I mention something on the podcast, I'll provide a link to it in a post on my blog so that you can find it without me reading out massive URLs. Let's start off with some news. The big news this time is that the AstroPi competition is being run again, and this time it's open to teams across Europe. French astronaut Thomas Pesquet will follow in Tim Peake's footsteps and journey to the International Space Station to run coded experiments created by the selected teams. You have until the 1st of November to get your project proposals in. There's lots more information out there, so please see the notes for the links. Also big news this week is the announcement of an update for Pixel, the new Raspberry Pi desktop that I covered last time. I'm pretty excited about this one. Flash now works through the Chromium browser. Simon Long from the Foundation confirmed this in the comments section on my blog. This means that we can now use, for the first time on the Raspberry Pi, things like Scratch 2.0. Flash is, of course, not everyone's favourite thing, so it's good to see the Foundation putting compatibility ahead of any negative feelings towards the software. Albert Hickey first found out that this worked, and you can see a video of it working on the blog post via the link in the notes. In industry news, US-based display manufacturer NEC has announced that they are to produce big screens with an embedded Raspberry Pi compute module. The screens, which start at 40 inches, are designed to be digital displays such as the kind you might see at airports or on the London Underground or in shops. The surprise of the announcement was that the displays would feature the as yet formally announced Compute Module 3. There's a couple of videos of the announcement in the blog post linked to in the notes, so take a look there if you'd like more information. I also noticed later on in the week that instead of one Raspberry Pi Compute Module 3, there'll also be a Compute Module 3 Lite, which will have less onboard memory. In other news, prestigious US business news outlet Bloomberg has recently visited the UK to cover Raspberry Pi for a news report. They took a trip to Gloucester to visit David Pride, who showed them his motorised Pi-powered Connect 4 machine, and also visited the Cotswold Raspberry Jam. Later in the segment, reporter Ashley Vance interviews Eben Upton aboard a punt in Cambridge to talk about the rationale behind the Pi. Here's the news report. It's about five minutes long if you wanted to skip it, but it is a nice segment and it's got a fantastic ending. It might not look like much, but this $35 assembly of electronics is a fully functioning computer. There's the ARM chip right here, tons of USB ports, an Ethernet port, even an HDMI port. With this teeny little thing, you can do just about anything. Released in 2012, the Pi has inspired near-religious devotion among geeky hobbyists and inventors. Some of them show off their Pi creations at things called Raspberry Jams. I went to see David Pride, who has a shrine to the low-cost personal computer at his home in Gloucester. What is this little device meant to you? It's changed my life. I was very happy, very stable, I had a nice, well-paid job, but I was very, very bored. And I realized at that point, if I wanted to do something different, this was, this was the opportunity to learn the skills that I'd always wanted to learn. Electronics, robotics, coding. His house is littered with Pi creations, from motorized cars to robots. Greetings to everyone watching Hello World. <laughs> That's a nice touch. <laughs> His most famous invention, though, is the Forbot an AI-infused machine that plays a mean, albeit slow, game of Connect Four. That is cool, man. <laughs> How long did it take you to make this? About three months of evenings and weekends. Connect Four is actually quite a complex game. There's an awful <laughs> lot of mathematics behind the AI that runs the system, so it makes it you... you make, oh, now I have to go. You make your move. But it is now thinking about the move it's taken. Oh, you bastard. You've just lost. I feel ashamed. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like I should have done more for the humans.
to really understand the soul of the Raspberry Pi, I had to head to its birthplace in Cambridge and dig deep into the city's traditions. This meant humiliating myself through something called punting, which is like canoeing, except dumber and more frustrating. Whoa. All right, whoa, dude. Did you pull it all the way out? Yeah, yeah. How do people do this, man? It's pretty intuitive. <laughs> My punting coach is Eben Upton. Easy. He's the Cambridge computer scientist who invented the pie. Around 2007, Eben grew alarmed by the declining number of computer science students in England and decided to try and inspire the youngsters with a new approach. I've always assumed Cambridge is the best place in the world to study computer science, and certainly the best place in the UK. And we saw this collapse in the number of people applying to study computer science at the University of Cambridge. Which is crazy, as the computing industry is blowing yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, you know, the computing industry is blowing up. Obviously, it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful environment to come and, to come and study in. The theory we came up with was that um, most of us who were arriving in the mid-90s, like I did, had grown up with cheap, programmable 8-bit microcomputers. You grew up using the BBC Micro. I grew that's up with, what got you into computing. Yeah, that's computer. it. I had a BBC Micro at school. It sat in the corner of the classroom. And those were beautiful machines. Supported by the UK government, the BBC Micro gave many students their first taste of coding and the possibility of what computers could do. I'm just going to scroll up. The Pi has very much followed in this tradition and emerged as a consumer hit along the way. It's now the third best-selling computer of all time behind the Mac and the PC. Our lifetime dream volume was 10,000 units. Now we're closing in on 10 million. But as that's happened, we've just got more ambitious, we've just got more greedy, I guess, about what we're trying to accomplish. We've gone from, can we move the needle from 200 to 600 people applying to computer science at Cambridge to, yeah, can we do the same for other universities? Can we do the same for other countries? Can we do the same for other subjects? Think big, Jason Statham impersonator. Think big. And finally this time, the Magpie have published a new Essentials book. This time it's focused on the C programming language. Written by the Foundation's Simon Long, it is a primer that covers the basics of the language. You can download it for free, buy it via the app, and no doubt, if it's popular, it will be available from the Pie Hut soon as a printed book. That's it for the news, here's some product related information. Following on from the last podcast, I can bring you the news that Albert Hickey has continued to work with the next doc to find the optimum configuration for working with the Raspberry Pi. He's published his results over on his blog, so please check out the notes for the link. Announced in the last few days, Pi Top Seeds are now on sale at CPC. For a limited time, the basic unit is available for £89 plus VAT. I've been having a play with the seed in the past couple of days, and I have to say I'm impressed so far. The screen is great, the desktop software is very clean and friendly, and it's easy enough to drop to the normal Raspbian desktop if you want to. I'll be using it a lot more over the next couple of weeks, so I'll be blogging about it extensively. The Magpie have done a nice review of the Pimeroni Dot Fat. It was featured in the last issue of the magazine, but they have published it on the web as well. Well worth reading if you're interested in the little board. They give it a very positive review, and it's it's a nice little toy to play around with if you want to display some text or some readouts. The Pi Hut have now started to stock the AB Electronics range of boards. AB Electronics is a very niche company in the Pi world. Not many people have heard of them, but they've been advertising in the Magpie and in Linux User, I believe. They're a nice range of boards. At the moment, I think um, Jamie at the Pi Hut is just stocking the zero size boards but they're well put together and well worth having a look. That's it for products. Now for crowdfunding. Now, I've scoured Kickstarter and Indiegogo this week and there's nothing new out there at this time. If you happen to notice any new campaigns or if you're launching one yourself, get in contact through the blog and I'll feature it on the podcast at the next opportunity. Also, on my blog there's a sidebar widget 
for the for a featured campaign. So if you want to get your campaign featured in there, please contact me through the blog as well. Now on to a roundup of the events coming up in the next few weeks. There are lots of upcoming events, so keep an ear out for any that might be near you. Let's start with this coming weekend. These are all on Saturday the 22nd of October. First up we have the Coventry and Warwickshire Raspberry Jam at the Central Library in Coventry. East London Raspberry Jam is in Barking Library. The Huddersfield Raspberry Jam is in Huddersfield Library. And Rayleigh Raspberry Jam is in Rayleigh Library. There's lots going on in libraries, they make very good venues for Raspberry Jams. On Sunday the 23rd there's the Tech Ilford Raspberry Jam in Redbridge Central Library and the New Haven Raspberry Jam at the Hillcrest Community Centre in New Haven. The following week, Saturday the 29th, there's a Raspberry Jam in Bayamon, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Puerto Rico. Wednesday the 2nd of November brings about the Leeds Raspberry Jam at the Swallow Hill Community Centre. On Saturday the 5th of November there is a Raspberry Jam in Casablanca and there's also the first Mexico Raspberry Jam. Also on the 5th is the Raider Raspberry Jam in Columbia, South Carolina. On Sunday the 6th of November, Raspberry Jam comes to Tokyo. The following day on the 7th of November, which is a Monday, Preston Raspberry Jam takes place. And on Tuesday the 8th of November, Stafford Raspberry Jam, which is run by Keris Locke. And in the following weeks there are events in Hull, New Jersey, Torbay, Wimbledon, Bogota, Columbia and Baltimore. If you'd like to advertise your event on this podcast, just make sure it's on the Raspberry Jam calendar and I'll pick it up next time I prepare for an episode. You could also, if you'd like, send me an audio clip telling me about your jam and I'll edit it into the podcast. This is a great way to get the word out about your jam. Now let's move on to some featured projects, which is probably everybody's favourite part of the podcast. Architecture in Portland, Maine have hooked up a pie to their coffee machine and popcorn maker. When a fresh batch of either is produced, it uses the Slack API to notify the team. They've also attached some relays to it to activate a full-size traffic light on the wall of their office. It's all done in good fun and you can read a lot more about it on their website which I've linked to in the notes. Spencer Organ is a teacher in the West Midlands and he's already got Christmas fever. He's developed and uploaded to GitHub a touchscreen compatible digital advent calendar. Photographs appear behind the doors and you can change these as you see fit just by replacing the current image files. He's done a really good job on this using photographs that he sourced and it's a great project for, for the Christmas season. Stuart Harrison was frustrated with his son's school's attempt to come up with a reward system and, th and thought their front end was a bit naff. So, using a screen scraper and his own data analysis, he came up with a better interface. He then went one step further and came up with his own way of rewarding good behaviour and recording bad behaviour via a Raspberry Pi and some Amazon Dash buttons. It's apparently been very effective with his son and you can read more about the link in the notes. The world seems obsessed with Pokemon Go at the moment can't see the attraction myself, but that doesn't mean that I can't appreciate some of the projects that have sprung up around it. In a previous episode I covered Philip Organ's Pokemon Pokedex. This time I want to highlight Adafruit's Ruiz Brothers work on a Pokemon tracking device. This ingenious little project hacks into the Pokemon API and then lights up LEDs depending on which type of animal is nearby. They've created a special case of the device which is based on a Pi Zero and you can read more over at Adafruit. I really like the way the Ruiz brothers attack their um, tutorials. They come up with a wide variety of things to do including 3D printing, programming, hacking into APIs and this one's really good. Just don't use it with your main Pokemon account because you might get locked out because it's against the terms of use but we'll gloss over that for now. Joe Fawkes wanted to create a handheld retro gaming device with the Raspberry Pi Zero, but he wanted to keep the budget down. So he made one around an old Samsung mobile phone box, used tactile buttons and a cheap battery. What he's come up with he's called the Bodge Boy, and it's pretty cool, and it does keep the cost down exactly as he wanted. Here's a nice project from Richard Saville. He's taken one of his own Zero Seg boards, which were available from the Pi Hut, 
and then hooked it into the WordPress API to get page view statistics for his blog. Displayed in lovely seven segment goodness, it's a nice project for beginners. I've always loved it when people put pies inside old consoles. This time it's the Wii U's turn. The Wii U is not an old console, it's a fairly new one, but that doesn't mean it's any less cool. Over at pseudomod.com, Banjo Kazuli has shared some photographs of his build, which involved ripping the guts of the console out and replacing it with a stripped down Raspberry Pi 3. You would think there wasn't enough room in there, but he's taken the GPIO header of the Raspberry Pi 3 off to fit it in. My top project for this episode has got to be this wonderful Halloween costume. Wolfie has a 12 year old granddaughter and he wanted to make something special for her. He came up with a wearable disco ball with 288 WS2811 LEDs embedded into it. The sequencing of the LEDs is handled by a Raspberry Pi 2 and the physical framework is made out of suspended ceiling hanger wire wrapped in chicken wire. It looks to be fairly lightweight and incredibly blinky. There is more video footage linked from the blog post, so take a look at the notes for the, for the link, and he's written the whole thing up over at Thingiverse. That's it for projects, and in fact that's it for this episode. I hope those of you who are watching the video don't mind my eyes being slightly off camera. I am reading from a script. Um, it's about the only way I can do the podcast because I get very, very nervous and I can't ad-lib to save my life. I do amateur theatre and not being able to ad-lib has left me unstuck a few times so I hope you'll forgive me just reading off the script for now. Hopefully in the future it will become a bit more freeform. This weekend I'm hoping to visit the Derby Mini Maker Fair and I'll be taking my video camera with me to interview people there and to see what cool projects they've got. Some of them will be Pi related, some of them won't be. I'm particularly looking, looking forward to seeing the Pi Zero Power Tesla coil which could be extremely impressive. So, until next time, take care and watch out for the next episode. Bye.